So, I invite you to open your Bibles to Romans chapter 8. If you don't have one of the lesson sheets, I think there's some back there on the table. You can get one, and we will get to that here in just a moment. Uh, as far as uh, updates, uh, Bud is not doing very well right now, so keep Bud and May in your prayers. Also, uh, Lucinda's parents, both uh, they're in a nursing home. They both uh, now have uh, the COVID virus, and... Lucinda's dad is in uh, St. Francis Hospital in the ER, and he's not responding to the treatment. So uh, keep that family in your prayers also. Well, they're in assisted living, but he's in uh, St. Francis ER right now. Um, I understand that, I, I don't know if we mentioned it last week, Roger Upton was, was very sick, and he's... Uh, on the mend, it wasn't COVID, it was some other stuff, uh, but they will not be here again today. He's still trying to recover from, from that. Uh, and I don't have any updates on anybody else. But let's uh, have a word of prayer and we'll start with class. Our Holy Father in Heaven, we just want to thank you for being our God and Father. We want to thank you for the great love that you have for us. We want to thank you for your son, Jesus, who gave everything for us. Thank you for this church. We ask, Father, that you would bless us here. We uh, pray that you'll be with uh, all of our members that are not here, Father, and we just pray that they can soon come and be back with us. We are especially mindful of those that uh, have grave health issues. We're thinking about Bud and, and May and Lucinda's dad and and uh, the many others of our number, Father, that uh, are, are suffering health issues. And just uh, pray for their strength and their comfort, and just ask that you be with those families. Father, be with all of our classes this morning, and uh, direct us to, uh, in your word that we can be better servants in your kingdom. We just thank you for loving us, and thank you for Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. The December 27th lesson is uh, about our mindset, our spirituality mindset, and uh, pleasing God either for peace or if we're against God, it's hostility. And it starts in uh, uh, verse 4, but before we get to verse 4, I want to go back to verses 1 and 2 because to know what our mindset is, we have to understand what uh, Paul is talking about in verses 1 and 2 because that is what affects our mindset. So if you've got your Bibles, Romans chapter 8, verses 1 and 2, says, Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death. So Paul is talking about two different laws here. Uh, law of the Spirit... and the law of sin and death. What is the law of sin and death? Anybody, take a shot. Pardon? Okay. It's, uh, it re reflects back to the, the law of Moses. And it's just not restricted to the law of Moses, but this actually could be just the general law of, of people, knowing what to do is right. You know, uh, people have always known right things to do and wrong things to do. For instance... Uh, has it ever been right, whether there's a law written for it or not, has it ever been right to commit murder? So it's just, people just know there are right things that you do and there are wrong things that you do. Now why would it be called the law of sin and death? If you sin, you die. I mean, basically, that's what the law was. When we look at the law of Moses, 
uh, the law of Moses gave people, here's what you need to do in order to be right with God. You do all these things, you do the right things, and you are right with God. But if you break the law in any form, you know, the, uh, we, we can read where uh, the same law that says thou shalt not commit adultery also says thou shalt not murder. If you don't commit adultery but you still murder, you've still broken the law. So, and, and Romans 3.23 tells us that all sin and fall short of the glory of God. So we all are, are lawbreakers. Uh, by the law, if you sin, the penalty is death. Now, the death we talk about here, and uh, we'll talk about this some more, is separation from God. It, it's death. You, your body dies, but your spirit dies also, because we're talking about the spirit. So, separation from God is basically the death that it's talking about. So there's two laws. There's the law of the spirit uh, of life. What is the law of the spirit of life? What is that one? That's Jesus. Okay. Jesus came, gave his life, paid the price. Uh, by the law of Moses, if you committed a sin, what were you supposed to do? You're supposed to take your sacrifice to the temple. They offered the sacrifice. And that gives you uh, back in a relationship with, with God. But uh, if you break the law again, you've got to take another sacrifice. And then you break the law again, you've got to take another sacrifice. So it's, it never fully released you from, from the penalty of death. Uh, but Jesus, being our sacrifice once for all, was the atoning sacrifice that purifies us and gives us life. So the law of spirit of life is found in Jesus Christ. The law of mercy and grace, we might say. So, based upon these two laws, uh, it says you've got to set your mindset. Uh, verse, uh, well, we'll get down to verse 4 here. But your, your mindset is based upon one of these two laws. Either you're, you're living by the law of the spirit of life through Jesus Christ, or you're living by the law of sin and death. And somebody might say, well, I don't, I don't recognize that law. Okay, I don't recognize gravity. But the law of gravity still pulls me down. The laws that, that God has that, that says you need to live right with him, and if you don't, there's penalties is there whether we want to recognize it or not. So it is there. So let's get to our questions. Uh, back into your Bibles. Let's start at Romans chapter 4. Um, talking about the mindset based upon these two laws. So that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So there's your two laws. The laws of the Spirit... The law of the flesh, sin and death. Verse 5. For those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who are according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the Spirit is life and peace. Because the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so, for those who are of the flesh cannot please God. So question one there says, what two options for setting our minds do we have? What are your, your options? Set your mind on flesh, or spirit. Now how do you set your mind on those things? Uh, the word for set your, set your mind on it, it, it the Greek word, uh, has a strong connotation that you think or dwell on those things. It's not just you think about it and then it's over. It, it's, it's like you meditate on, on those things. So how do you do that? Let's go to... Uh, we're going to jump out of 
these verses. Jump over to Galatians chapter 5, if you would. And we'll, we'll kind of talk about them. Galatians chapter 5. It's just a little ways over. And then we'll come back. Starting at verse 19, I believe it is. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident. And they are immorality, impurity, idolatry, uh, sorcery, enmities, uh, strife, Jealousy, I'm getting out here, outbursts of, of anger, disputes, uh, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, Uh, where am I carousing? Uh, and things like these. Those are things of the flesh. Um, but the things of the Spirit are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness. Is it goodness? Goodness? Faithfulness? Self-control? Did I get them all? Leave one out? Huh? Gentleness. I always leave gentleness out. How are you spelled? So, how do you set your mind on these things? How, how do you dwell, meditate, think on these things? How would you do that? Put them into practice. The things you meditate on are the things you basically will do. And that's what the, the, the Bible is teaching us here. If you meditate on, on immorality... If you're constantly thinking about immorality, uh, that's consuming your mind, most likely you're going to do something immoral. Uh, if you're thinking about anger, if your mind is filled with anger, uh, where you hate people, where you don't trust people, you're angry at them because they've, nobody gives you a break, uh, then you're going to have outbursts. And that's actually what it says in there is outbursts of anger. If, if you are an angry, angry person, something's going to happen. You're going to have an outburst of anger, and you're going to explode, and you're going to terrify the people that are around you, and that's going to be your action because you're meditating on the anger that you have in your life. So what you meditate on, what you think about, are there are going to result in the actions that you have. If you think about love, joy, peace, these kind of things, if, if those are the things you think about, uh, when you see somebody that's in need, you're probably going to take action and help that person. And, and this is what Paul's talking about here. We, we, we have these things that, that uh, uh, we meditate on, that we think about, and that is what will pro provoke us to do certain things. Um, our conduct, our actions come from what we think on or what we dwell on. Any more comment on this? There's other verses we could look at uh, that, that have similar lists as we find in Galatians here. Uh, but they're all about doing those right things. And, and those are the things that are pleasing to God. 
Uh, remember it said that the two things, one will lead to hostility with God. These things are hostile towards God. These things are pleasing with God. So are you pleasing with God, pleasing to God with your actions, or are you hostile towards God with your actions? And it's based back on what you meditate on. Question number two, what does a mindset on the flesh lead to? Death. What does a mindset on the spirit lead to? Life. Uh, Romans 6.23. Uh, if, you, if you go to Romans 6.23, I don't have it there. But it says, uh, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is life. Uh, something like that. I, I paraphrase that a little bit there. But there's other verses other than just what we were reading here in Romans that tell us these same things. i got to get back to Romans here. Romans 8. Um, and that death, as we, as we mentioned, is a separation from God. Uh, we, we think about death of the body, but this is talking about death of your spirit. You're separated from God. Uh, and that is not the desirable thing to be. So number three, Paul says a mindset on the flesh cannot please God because it approaches God how? Hostile. It approaches him in a hostile manner. God is not pleased with, with any of these things. So if this is what you meditate on, it's what you dwell on, it's the actions that you take, then God is not pleased with you. And if you're hostile with God... Uh, God is going to be hostile with you. I mean, that's just the, the easy way to say it. Um, the essential point uh, that we are guided by our fleshly mind, and uh, it, it, if we are guided by our fleshly mind, it sets us in opposition to God. And it tells us here that then there is no way that we are subject to God. In order to be pleasing to God, we have to be subject to Him. If we're hostile to him, we're not pleasing with him. Um, and, and it's interesting. Let's go back to the, to the scriptures there. Uh, verse 7, Because the mindset on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so, and those who are in the flesh cannot please God. I, I thought that was interesting there. It says... Uh, uh, for it is, not e they, it is not even able to do so. Those that are consumed with the, the flesh aren't even able to. They become so entrenched in, in that way of, being, of, of thinking that they just become incapable of thinking about the right things and pleasing God. Um, the message of the cross, the message of repentance, the message of forgiveness has no effect on them because they are so entrenched in, in this way of thinking. Um, we're doing good on time. Uh, we're, we're down to number four. Stephen accused the Jews of constantly uh, treating the Spirit in what way? Turn over to uh, Acts chapter 7. In Acts chapter 7, uh, this is where Stephen is put to death. Where, where he becomes the first martyr, he's stoned, he's uh, telling the, uh, the, the, the Jews, uh, making his defense, and in verse 51, it's, he says, uh, You men who are stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears are always resisting the Holy Spirit. You are doing just what your fathers did. So what did uh, Stephen say that was the problem with these men? Okay, they're resisting the Holy Spirit. Resisting. What else does he does he call them there? Hearts aren't right. 
Well, that's, that's the solution. He calls them stiff-necked. You ever, ever know anybody that's stiff-necked? What does it mean to be stiff-necked? Huh? Stubborn? Unyielding? Somebody's got to, Connie says I get stiff-necked sometimes. We uh, disagree on something and I get stiff-necked and usually I'm wrong. But not always. But we get that way. But these people... Uh, Stephen said, were this way about the gospel, about Jesus Christ. They were stiff-necked about, about God and, and the way they were going to worship God and what they wanted to do, and they were unwilling to, to look at anything else. Uncircumcised in the heart. They, they believed in the circumcision of the flesh. They didn't understand circumcision of the heart. Uh, the heart has to be touched, has to be changed, uh, in order to have that, that right... Uh, um, have their hearts right to be in, in the right spirit with God so uh, he's getting on them pretty hard here they're un, unwilling to look at Jesus for who God says he is they, they are so made up in their own mind they are unwilling to change question number five uh, we got to flip back over to Galatians now chapter five And we're going to read verses 1 through 5, uh, which, if yours has a title, my title says, Walk by the Spirit. For it is for freedom that Christ set us free, therefore keep standing firm, and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. Behold, I, Paul, say to you that if you receive circumcision, Christ will be of no benefit to you. And I testify again to every man who receives circumcision, that is, he is under obligation to keep the whole law. You have been severed from Christ. You who are seeking to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace. For we, through the Spirit, by faith, are waiting for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything but faith working through love. Paul, is, as he's writing to the Galatian church here, uh, a problem has come up. The, the Jewish believers are telling the Gentile believers that before you can become a Christian, you have to be circumcised. Now, what does circumcision have to do with it? It goes back to the law of Moses. So, in order for you to become a Christian Gentile, you've got to be subject to the law of Moses first. And Paul says, no, that's not the way it is. Uh, if, if, if you're counting on the law of Moses in order to make you a Christian, you've missed the whole point of the gospel, is what he's saying here. You, you've gone back, you, you're going to have to live by the, by the law then, and the consequences of the law is death. Uh, so, uh, Christ set us free, but how could we sell out to slavery again? Well, these people were selling out to slavery again, by trying to go back to the law of Moses. Uh, it doesn't work. Uh, this is what, what Paul's telling them. You, you got a, a circumcision, uncircumcision means nothing. The only thing that means anything is Jesus Christ. So how can we, I don't think there's any, any uh, body here that was circumcised in order to become a Christian. Uh, went back to the old law, how could we return to slavery? Is it possible for us to return to slavery, as he mentions here? Okay, go back to the world. If you, have, uh, if you were living in the world, you lived by the flesh, then you were bound by sin and death, regardless of whether you believed in the law of Moses or not. You're bound by, by the flesh if you live in the world. If you become a Christian and you return back to the world, you've returned yourself to slavery. 
And this is the point that, that he's trying to make here. Once you become a Christian, you need to stay bound to that. You need to put your mind thinking on those things. That needs to be your mindset. You start thinking about the things of the world, you go back to the world, you've lost all that. Uh, and, and this is what he's trying to say. Another thing might be uh, self-justification. If once you've accepted Jesus Christ and you've been justified by the blood of Jesus Christ and then you go back and say, well, I've got to justify myself in order to be right with God and you start trying to do all these things to build up your brownie points with God, uh, you've left that gospel of reliance on Jesus Christ and you're back to trying to do everything yourself. And it doesn't work. No matter how hard we try, we can't be good enough in ourselves to be pleasing to God. So that's just a couple ways that, that we could be returned to slavery. Uh, go back to the world or go back to trying to, to justify ourselves. And there are a lot of uh, uh, religious people in the world that try to, to earn their way into heaven. Um, Probably people in the church that try to earn their way into heaven. And, and you just can't do it. So you've got to really be, be watchful and rely on Jesus Christ, on the blood of Jesus Christ, and rely on God because that's the only way we're going to get there. Question number six. What is the Spirit's role in our life of freedom? And this comes out of verse five. Uh, let me... See if I can erase some of this. I want to put something else up here. There's a, a contrast that, that uh, Paul's talking about here uh, in Galatians. Uh, through the Spirit... By faith, he talks about that. And the contrast to, to through the Spirit and by faith is by the flesh. And by works of the law. And you look at that and you say, well, that's just what you had written up there before. It's the same thing, basically. But Paul's talking about it uh, here again in Galatians. Um, so what is the Spirit's role in our life of freedom? Does the Spirit have a role? What does the Spirit do for us? This is a contrast. What does the Spirit do through the Spirit, by faith, what does the Spirit do for us? Pardon? Keeps us connected to God. Okay? How does he do that? How does the Spirit keep us connected? I like that. But how does he do that? What does the Spirit do for you? Okay. Keeps our minds in tune to God. The Spirit, and I, I can't explain to you how the Spirit does it, but the Spirit brings to our recollection things that we 
know that are right. Uh, you ever read a verse in the Bible and somewhere down the road something happens and that verse comes to your mind? Yeah, that's Spirit working in you, reminding you of what God is telling you. He, uh, he, he helps direct us. Uh, his spiritual power uh, helps us to, to live uh, in the way that we're supposed to live. He brings those things to mind. What about prayer? What does the Spirit do for us in prayer? Okay. The Spirit interprets what we say. Okay, keeps us steadfast. Hope y'all don't mind me walking up and down. That's the only way I can hear. In prayer, he 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 talks to God for us, doesn't he? He 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 uh, takes what we say and and he interprets that to God. And and because uh, sometimes we don't know what to pray for, we don't know how to pray. You ever been there, where you go to pray and you really don't know how to do it, but but the Spirit does. And he takes those prayers to God, and that helps keep us in tune with the Spirit, with God. It helps us to stay steadfast. Uh, the, the Spirit plays a strong role there in, uh, in helping us. And it, and it does that by faith, by our faith. We believe that he's going to do that, and he does it. You have faith in God that Jesus Christ is his Son, and the Spirit can fill your life and, and help you do those things. Uh, we are already made righteous by the blood of Jesus Christ, but it says here uh, in these verses that, that we await the eternal blessings of righteousness, and, and that's all the promises that God has given us. And the Spirit reminds us of those promises and, and helps us so that we can be looking forward to those promises. So the Spirit plays... A major role in our lives in, in how we should be. Yes. Yes. He is with us. He's indwelling. And I can't explain how he dwells in us, but the Spirit of God dwells in us. We become the temple of God when we become a Christian and that spirit comes into us and it lives in us and that keeps us in that relationship with God. So we do have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit uh, and, and it is a, a promise that God gave us. He says that that, that indwelling of that spirit is a promise, is the seal promises that he gave to us. Uh, number seven, why are spiritual people needed in the life of the church? And this is Galatians 6, 1 and 2, so uh, still in Galatians. Brother, brethren, even if anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, each one looking to your own self, so that you too will not be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. So why do we need spiritual people in the church? I just gave you two reasons right there. Or Paul did. Paul gave you two reasons. To restore... If someone is caught in a trespass and they are falling away from God, you who are spiritual, restore that one. That's one of the jobs that, as Christians, that we should have, that, that we do have. God has given to us. We see somebody uh, failing, we need to restore them. And the other one, is verse 2, bear one another's burdens. 
You ever bear somebody else's burden? You ever been out somewhere and trying to carry something heavy and, and you can't hardly carry it? Somebody comes up and helps you carry the load? That's bearing one another's burdens. That's what that amounts to. Um, when, when I was doing Boy Scouts and uh, I think Robert was in Boy Scouts. I don't. I don't think. Uh, Tom, I think Thomas was still in Cub Scouts. We went on a uh, on a backpacking trip, and uh, we had one boy in the troop that uh, didn't do what his scoutmaster told him to do. I wasn't the scoutmaster, but the night before we took off on this hike, you opened your pack up and you laid everything out. And the, the scoutmaster come by and see what you had in your pack. And if there's stuff you didn't need in your pack, he'd tell you, and you're supposed to put that in your tent, and it stayed in your tent. Well, this one boy had a whole bunch of stuff. He had like six pairs of socks and five pairs of underwear and extra jeans and all kinds of stuff. And uh, the scoutmaster came and looked at all that, told him what to put in his pack, said put all the rest of that in your tent. Well, he went back to his tent and put it all back in his pack. Now, the reason he did that is his mama told him he needed all that stuff. So he trusted his mama rather than his scoutmaster. Anyway, the next day, towards the end of the day, this kid is struggling. I mean, he can't hardly walk anymore because his pack's so heavy. Once we figure out what's going on, a couple of the other boys come up, and they grab the pack between them and let the kid walk without his pack, and they're carrying his pack for him. That's bearing one another's burdens. His burden was too heavy because his mama told him what to do. But the other scouts shared that burden. That's the way we're supposed to be in the church. Somebody has a burden, a trouble, a problem, we are supposed to bear one another's burdens. Uh, Sue and Carol Hart got a little bit of a burden right now. They, they can't do what they want to do. Sue's a little bit weak. She doesn't have her strength. She, she's on a special diet. I know there's several people have been taking food over to them. Salt free. <laughs> Linda, Linda doesn't like salt free. You get sprinkled a little bit on. Uh, that's bear, helping bear their burdens because I can tell you one thing, Carol can't cook. I don't know if he could boil water, but Carol doesn't cook. Now their daughter's been coming out, coming from Owasso, and she's helping. She's helping to bear their burden also. And, and, and there's others that we have helped many times. Uh, we're bearing one another's burden. So that's what spiritual people are supposed to do. We're supposed to restore those that are falling away, and we're supposed to bear one another's burdens. Question number eight. Paul says, we, as a church, are a temple of the Spirit, where the Spirit dwells collectively among us. How does he say our mindset should be impacted by this truth? This is out of 1 Corinthians chapter 3. So we're going to flip over to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I'll get there in a second. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. Do you not know that you are a temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If any man destroys the temple of God, God will destroy him, for the temple of God is holy, and that is what you are. Paul here is talking collectively. He's not talking about an individual. He's talking collectively uh, about the church. And he says, you are the temple of God. Uh, as a church, we are the temple of the Spirit. Uh, the Spirit dwells collectively among us. The Spirit is here when we worship. Uh, the Spirit is a part of us. So the question was, how does he say our mindset should be impacted by this truth? Well, what's the truth there that he's talking about? Verse 17. 
What's the truth? If any man destroys the temple, the temple, here again, being the church, if any man destroys the temple of God, What is God going to do? God will destroy him. If someone came into your house and just started tearing everything up, how would you react to that? Would it make you happy? You do the happy dance? You'd be angry, wouldn't you? You'd be, be very upset, and you would want to take a retribution out on that person because of what they did to your house. Well, that's the way God is. You come in and destroy his house, his temple, his people, and God will destroy you. Now, how can you destroy the temple of God? How could you destroy the temple of God? Going back to 1 Corinthians here, before this verse, uh, Paul is pleading with the church at Corinth for unity. Uh, he's preaching Jesus Christ and his, Him crucified in chapter 2. In chapter 1, he gets on to him and says, you're divided. Some of you are saying, I have Paul, I have Peter, I have Christ, I have Cephas or, or whoever. He says, you're divided, you need to have unity. You're, you're, you're destroying the, the temple of God. He says, uh, uh, the mystery is revealed through the Spirit. Uh, in verse uh, 16 of chapter 2, it says, we are to have the mind of Christ. Talking about your mindset here. We're to have the mind of Christ. Uh, in chapter 3, he starts talking about the foundations for the church. You, you build the church. We are a unit. We, we build this thing together. It's made up of, of us as a, uh, as a group. And uh, the Spirit dwells in us in the church. And that's what he says in verse 16. In 17, he gives a warning. If you destroy God's temple, God will destroy you. What was the problem they had at Corinth? They had division. Or factions arguing. These things were destroying the temple of God, these factions. You go back to, to Galatians when we looked at at what the, the fruits of the flesh were. These are the fruits of the flesh here. These people had their mindset on what they wanted, not on what God wanted. So how can we destroy the temple of God? Start having factions, start having division, start arguing about what we're going to do. Everybody's got to have their own way, not God's way. So it all gets back to your mindset. Where is your mindset? Is your mindset set on the things of the flesh, or is it set on the things of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The fruits of the Spirit. If that's where our mindset is, the church will be built up. If it's on the flesh, on division and factions and arguing and angering and immorality and idolatry, then you'll destroy the church. And if you destroy the temple of God, it says that God will destroy you. So, how should this affect us? We should set our mind on the things of the Spirit. And we're out of time. And we got through that. Except for the bonus questions. If you turn the page, there's two bonus questions. Uh, we won't get to those. You can do those yourself. Thank you very much.